Was it as easy as you thought it would be trying to quote build the internet? The answer is no, it was definitely not easy. But what's so nice is you're going in with this sort of like rose colored glasses that everything's going to be okay and everything's going to work out. And you just sort of take one punch on the chin at a time. And then finally you wake up and you realize, oh, wow, I'm a professional business athlete, <laughs> you know, who's been in the ring for a very long time. But uh, no, it wasn't easy, but it was very, very rewarding. And, and typically those things that are super hard that you put all your energy and your whole life into are the things that give you the most amount of gratification and joy. Jared Lopicolo is the founder and CEO of Noble Studios, a web design agency that's been going for over 20 years. In this conversation, we talked about his experience as an architect and how it helps him to be a great leader now and in building the foundation of a company and in project management for developing websites and many other things. We also talked about his experience as a founder, how he's evolved as a founder, where he's taking the business, what he's learned from all of this, and so much more. We know you're going to love episode 205 with Jared Lopicolo. Let's get to it now. You started out wanting to be an architect, and somewhere along the way, you decided that you wanted to not do that anymore. Yes. What was the catalyst that made you realize you wanted to change your focus? Well, it, this was back in uh, 2003. And, you know, to your point, yeah, I, I actually had this aspirational dream of being one of the youngest architects in 39 of the U.S. states. And and I at the time, I was working as an intern and then slowly, you know, kind of moved my way up into this architecture firm. And I really got exposed to this concept that's called user centric design. And if you, and I always use Disney as an example, cause they, they just do such a great job of creating all the touch points. But if you've ever been on a Disney cruise, uh, isn't a good example because you're an isolated kind of, you know, moment, um, you look down on the carpet and there's Disney prints in the carpet. You look in the walls, you see Disney wallpaper, you look, you hear in the background of the music and you hear your favorite Disney soundtrack from one of the movies and that touch point was something I just kind of fell in love with. And I was working on a project at this architecture firm and they, it was a, it was a restaurant and they wanted to not only design the restaurant, the layout where the booths go, but all the way down to the silverware, to the art on the walls, to the logo, to the brand, to even building a website, right? And this is back in 2003 where an architecture firm is building websites for their projects. And, and even plating the food, right? Like using the S and the logo with the sauce on the food to plate it, to show the chefs that we wanted to own every single touch point so that you have really that, that fully immersed user centric design. And I was placed on the digital stuff because I was young at the time. So they're like, we need you to help do the digital fly throughs. And, and then also, by the way, uh, build this thing called a website. And, and so all of a sudden I just fell in love with this idea of building the internet. And at the time, my wife, who's a partner at the, the company, we started the company together. She was a copywriter and she was working in Vegas as uh, on, on this project, which is everyone knows it. It's what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So she was working on that team, creating that tagline. And we just thought to ourselves, wow, you know, this is a whole new world to get into this idea of building the Internet, you know, connecting other humans and people from one location to the next. And we just fell in love with this concept of virtual architecture. Uh, as opposed to this physical architecture. And that, that was sort of the fork in the road that, that we both decided to take. Was it as easy as you thought it would be trying to, quote, build the internet? You know, it's, it's, there's something really healthy about being naive. And, you know, because you go through, you do things that you don't expect you would have done. And the confidence you have, when especially starting a business, you know, if, even if you're going to start a pizza restaurant, you, you know, you're, you think that you make the best pizzas in the world and you've got it down and everyone compliments you on them. And then you just dive into it. And then you realize it, using that same pizza restaurant analogy, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do inventory management. I don't know how to do special. Oh, there's a competitor that opened three blocks down that says they offer the best pizza in the world. And so the answer is no, it was definitely not easy. Um, but what's so nice is you're going in with this sort of like rose colored glasses that everything's going to be okay and everything's going to work out. And you just sort of take one punch on the chin at a time and then finally you wake up and you realize, oh, wow, I'm a I'm a professional business athlete, <laughs> you know, who, who's been in the ring for a very long time. But uh, no, it wasn't easy, but it was very, very rewarding. And, and typically those the, those things that are super hard that you put all your energy and your whole life into are the things that uh, that give you the most amount of gratification and joy. Are you sure it's not more like you wake up one day and you realize that you're really freaking bruised on your face? <laughs> that and you realize, shit, I only know how to be a boxer, you know? And so that's the other thing. You wake up five, six years into it and you're like, well, now I'm sort of got these 
you know, golden handcuffs. I've created this business that I can't get away from. Uh, to your point, I'm in the ring all the time. Um, but you just, that's where I think it's like, you know, that one advice I always give to anyone, anyone even listening right now, it's like, it's really about following your passion. And because you do wake up and you realize, yeah, I'm bruised, I'm beaten, I'm, you know, and, 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 and I could probably have chosen a different path. But if you follow your passion, naturally money is going to follow, relationships are going to follow, uh, and you're going to feel uh, that fulfilled part of your life. I just interviewed someone who said to me, I was told this idea of follow your passion, he said. And decades later, I realized that if you just follow your passion, you're probably going to fail. But if you follow your passion and you tie it into purpose, then your chances of success are much higher. I love that. There's actually a book that the the founder of Whole Foods, uh, John Mackey, he, it's a book called um, Purpose and Passion or Passion and Purpose. And it's exactly what you just talked about. It's like follow your passion, but with a guided purpose. And then that allows you to rally everyone around you. It gives you, you know, a waypoint or a filter to make decisions. If you fall off your path a little bit, you know, you get right back on it because purpose drives you back to the path. But you can't, I think you can't start on a purpose without the passion. I think passion is like the spark that ignites the flame, if you will. And then the purpose is about kind of managing that fire and stoking it and adding wood to it and giving it what it needs so it, so it stays alive. And then those punches determine how much you're actually passionate about that thing. Yes. Yeah. How hard you take a, a, a hit to the chin. Uh, is going to be is going to show you how deep you are in your in your line of passion. Sometimes people right away just the the simplest of you know misstep or oh we lost this client and they fold up because you know e it's easy to be a, a fair weather sailor. It's it's much harder right to do it in really choppy bad weather and and to sort of get through that storm. You you really have to have that that passion that vision that mission and and do it at all costs even when you're bruised and you're broken and you're tired. Uh, it's to pick yourself up and dust yourself off and, and keep charging towards the mission. I'm in a Discord server of about 5,000 people that are running like e-commerce brands and marketing agencies or wanting to start. And I was invited to join the server as a, an expert because they don't really get access to people like me who have more experience and can talk about a wider range of topics. And so they, they want me to talk about these things. So they asked me to answer a question, which was, you know, how did you handle kind of these little defeats here and there? Or or how do you feel uh, when like you lose a client or something bad goes, you know, goes wrong? And I said, it doesn't matter where you are in your business, even when you're successful, that stuff still gets you. I go, you're going to have fear and anxiety, no matter if yeah. you're making zero dollars or $20 million a day, the fear and anxiety you have just changes. The things you are afraid yeah. of change. Right When you're starting, your fear is I'm not going to be successful. When you're successful, your fear is you're going to lose it all. Yes. <laughs> and, and people are like, huh. You know, they're, they're young. A lot of them are Gen Z, so they haven't really had a chance yeah. to think about this stuff. And I'm like, like, the happiest times I've had was when I was 22 years old and I was an English teacher in China and I was broke. Yes. Ooh. Yes. Having a business and being successful, I've... And I have anxiety. I have panic attacks. I go, if you want that, yeah. welcome to the club. But if you don't want that, do not start a business. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, you know, not that I ever wanted this on anyone, but when the pandemic hit, right, everyone felt as if they were an entrepreneur. And I went, what I mean by that is they brought their work into their personal life, right? They usually they could have this sort of umbilical cord cut where, you know, when I'm at home, I'm only at home. And when I'm at work, I'm at work and I leave the two separate, you know, that church and state, if you will. And, and so there was an element of like, okay, now you know what it feels like to be an entrepreneur where you are literally working in your living room and or your small office or bedroom or hiding phone calls because there's kids in the background and such. And, and I think this journey, right, as an entrepreneur, you are going to feel the pain, you are going to, you know, have missteps and stuff. And I think you have to subscribe to the idea that, you know, that what you're doing is important. And, and that, you know, it's okay to fail. We oftentimes ask ourselves and our and the teams that are that are with us and people that we are coming on board, do you love to win or do you hate to lose? And that mm. distinction really helps separate a line. And I I freaking hate to lose because what it means is I didn't do something right. I didn't plan. I didn't forth I didn't anticipate what was going to happen. And so if you subscribe to this curiosity and this, I'm gonna be a life learner, which ultimately established our tagline of let's be better every day. 
it's a subscription that we all sort of, you know, sign up for that every day we could do something a little bit better. And so when you, when you do fail or when something goes wrong or a project doesn't go well or the client fires you or a team member quits you as a man, you know, you're the manager and they quit you. You just got to look at yourself and say, you know what? This is where I learn. Change is where I actually learn. And if I subscribe to this idea that I can be better, then, then I'm going to learn and I'm going to be better tomorrow. But if you're winning all the time and everything's a breezy, easy, super smooth, then likely you're not actually pushing yourself hard enough to be a better person and to contribute, you know, to the, to the, to the world in a different way. And so, so yeah, so naturally if you're going to be in entrepreneurship, you're going to, you're going to fall down a lot. Um, but it's okay. It's like, that's when you learn how to, that's how you learn how to walk is when you fall. Right. But the days where I was winning all the time were the days that I didn't have anxiety. <laughs> right. Those, those well, then it, you know, I, I was just at a wedding over the weekend and I asked my buddies the first time I've been at a wedding in a while. And I said, so are you nervous? Do you have anxiety? He goes, oh my gosh, do I ever? I said, well, that means it's important. Yeah. You well, know? I mean, what I was doing, yeah, it wasn't really that important. I didn't really care. It was just really good money really easily. Yep. That's the point. It's like but usually it when you great. make good money quick and, and such, it just doesn't, it doesn't do what you really need it to do, which at the end of the day, yes, we all chase the money in, in a way because we want, we know what money equals, which is freedom and, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, you really, you'll get there. You'll likely get there, but you don't want to get there by only chasing the money because you'll wake up and you'll say, you know, I didn't really learn much, you know, and I'm not, I'm not this old sage or I didn't, you know, I don't have all these lessons that I can teach others, right? That pay it forward model. And so you've got to, you, you got to make, you got to, if it was hard, everyone, or if it was hard, no one would do it, right? If it, if it was easy, everyone would. And, and you want to separate, separate yourself from the pack a bit. I've learned a lot more in the last four and a half years, five years of not having as much success as I used to have and yep. figure, working towards how I can get back to that success. And yep. It's been extremely painful, but it's been very, I feel like gratifying is an unfairly positive word to use in this regard yeah. <laughs> because of just how stressful and, and difficult it's been. But, um, but it's, it's been gratifying to learn so much in the process of going, well, I'm going to try affiliate marketing. Didn't work, but I learned a little bit more about how ads yep. function. You know, uh, I tried consulting again in in e-commerce uh, in the beginning i wanted to specifically consult e-commerce brands and i learned that they're not a great target for, for that and why right. um but i learned some more of their pain points which helped me to figure out some other services that they were stupidly happy to pay for so you know you uh, it, it but it takes you months oh, i'm gonna build a website i'm gonna promote this thing and then you, and and then you talk to people and you you know, learn that like, no, it's not actually the thing you should be doing. And then you go and you fix the website and you start promoting again and you start talking to people again. And then you go, oh, okay, yeah, it's working now. But it doesn't always work like that. Sometimes you hit on the first thing, the right, uh, you know, the right thing the first time and all that. Um, but I, I want to get to this tie-in between architecture and entrepreneurship that we had kind of teased uh, previously. Because when you're building the foundation of a company, you need to have a structure, right? If you don't have a structure, you're building a house of cards and you're not going to be able to scale. You're lucky if it doesn't fall apart just in its daily existence. And architecture requires a tremendous amount of planning before you can go build the thing because if you plan incorrectly, the building's going to fall down and people may die. So did you find that having experience as an architect helped you in starting this business? Did it hinder you because you had professional skills, but maybe not, you know, you had planning skills, but maybe not execution skills? Like, how did it help and, and did it or did it hinder you at all? Yeah, well, like many entrepreneurial journeys that people go on, typically the foundation that you've sort of invested into, right? Mine happened to be architecture, but typically they lend themselves in that journey. Um, and, and so, yes, I think there's, there's probably two angles that I would think about the architecture side. And to your point, this planning and this de dependencies, if you think about the services we started in providing, which was building internet, you know, website experiences, you know, um, uh, digital experiences, mobile applications, they actually all follow a very similar process. They, they uh, usually they're waterfall based. So there's one thing has to happen for the next thing to happen for the next thing to happen. 
Um, if you think about building a building, it's the same concept, right? You got to start with the foundation, then you start laying in all the, you know, the walls and you can't start putting carpet in until the very end, right? So if you think about building services like websites, you don't get to start adding content to the website until all the infrastructure is built, the taxonomy, um, you know, the site architecture and plan, who's coming to the website, same thing for a building, if you're building a school, you know that there's faculty, there's students, and then there's administration and, and then, you know, whatever else, janitorial services and whatnot. Same thing for a website. It's like, well, who's coming there? What are your audiences? What are their needs are? How do we get them through the rooms, AKA through the different, you know, pages? So, so from a service standpoint, it lend itself like pretty analogous. From a running a business standpoint too, if you think about dependencies, you think about anticipating needs, right? As an architect, you always have to think months, months, months in advance. And those original architects had to kind of keep everything into consideration. Like, you know, 2000 years ago, they had to understand sociology, they had to understand astronomy, they had to understand real religion and local politics and, you know, and then of course, actually mathematics and, and everything else to build the, and where, you know, shipping and logistics for materials, blah, 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 blah. Same concept for a business, right? You have to understand where the geography, the industries that you're working in, uh, you know, the future, right? This year, we're in an election year, right? Anticipating what that's going to do to consumer behavior and buyer personas and, you know, and, 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 and confidence, right? In actually purchasing or traveling or whatever the case is. And so you have to constantly really kind of survey everything. You've got to be this, you know, to a certain degree, this nomadic new new sociologist and psychologist all at once you know to understand the marketing side so yeah so that and then of course the structure of running a business itself uh you know making sure we're using a structure a framework and we're measuring the things that are important for us and all those pieces uh you know are built off of the foundation that 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 i had went through and then with season my partner and you know having copywriting as a background understanding again what the emotional uh triggers are for people to absorb a brand uh, what things will motivate people to purchase um you know culture of a brand right so you start thinking about all those things and it's natural that she works on the inside of the business we oftentimes refer to her as our like va vast uh like um like the the oh i'm not lost for the words but um Yes, thank you. Uh, and you know, this is like how the heart pumps and the, the the muscles work, and just all those pieces have dependencies as well. And so, so yeah. So, long story short, you know, most entrepreneurs what, and think about whoever, whatever you're going after, that foundation is likely going to land into that entrepreneurial journey. I'm glad you said the word psychology or the psychological aspects yeah. of the business, because you said typically people will you know invest their energy in learning some core skill when they're when they're young. And my dad's generation went into their career thinking this would be the only career they have. Right. I, I went into my psychology degree not knowing what the hell I was going to use it for. Right. But with the assumption that it would probably help me figure something out if I knew myself. Yes. And so one of the first things that psychology taught me was how to understand myself and if I can assess myself and I can reflect on myself, I can understand who I am and what I want, then I can understand others. And yep. from that, you know, from the last 16, 17 years after finishing my degree, I've applied psychology to everything I've done. And so for me, I feel like everyone should have one or two years of psychology in college. Yeah. If, whether you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a mechanic – I think everybody should be forced to learn a year or two of psychology instead of we, we take these elective classes that are like, yep. I, I took a class about like frogs and a class about cooking. Like I don't need that, you know, but the psychology right. classes were helpful because yeah. I learned about romantic relationship building and, and in group and out group think and, and observation and early childhood development and neuro neurological psychology. So I learned so many different things about different aspects of psychology that I'm well enough informed and well-rounded and well-traveled now through my, my personal interest in travel that I can look at most people's businesses and instantly find the problems that they're facing or that they may face in the future. Right. So psychology helps me to analyze, right? So you have this, this yeah. uh, planning through architecture where yeah. I have this strategy. I can, I can see a holistic picture and I can understand who are you, who are you? Is this business right for you? Are you targeting the right people? Are you finding them the right way? You know, are you giving them what they actually need? Right. So I, I can see things from a different point of view. Now I don't have the architecture side. I had to sure. learn 
like I literally had to learn what are the different pieces of a business and you know how do you organize. My brother is a finance person. His background is in finance, and and he taught me about spreadsheets when I was young. And he right. taught me he taught me about money. He taught me about how to understand the simple maths you need to understand are you going to be profitable in your venture. It it that's not what it was at the time, but that's how it's kind of expanded because of of that. So that's right. I feel very fortunate that him and I are so different because he doesn't really understand psychology and I don't really understand finance, but together we help each other to understand our areas of expertise so that we can understand ourselves better and we can understand, you know, what we need to do and, and who we need to work with and and all of that. So it works quite well, even though we don't run a business together. It's just a... Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far, and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work. And every week we bring you a new guest and a new story. And what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment, it's free to do. And if you don't like what we're doing later on, you can always unsubscribe. And either way, we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time. Thank you very much, and we'll take you back to the show now. Curiosity exchange, in a way. So, so uh, I think that more people should not be afraid of going to school and learning something that they may not use because if they're interested in entrepreneurship, which at the time I had no desire for entrepreneurship, it just kind of came yeah. to me after college. Uh, but if they invest in something that they're interested in, then they should be able to use that as a core skill to be able to build a business from, hopefully. Yeah, I think about – it's interesting that you talk about psychology. I think that is probably one of the most important – if you're not going to make that your primary, you know, sort of study or a, a field of expertise, you know, actually having that as like a minor or just even leaning it, leaning into it closely, like behind me, you see all these self-help books. Um, that's all effectively psychology, right? Is, is really kind of understanding human motivation, human behavior, um, anticipating their needs, right? And this, this allows us to be the most successful. And I remember in architecture, there was this one time we were designing a park and, and, you know, understanding human behavior, when, where to place benches, right? You would think that, oh, maybe it's a huge open park. Let's throw some benches in the middle. But now everyone's going to relate and they're going to remember, think about the park that you were in last. And there's a bench and the, behind the bench, there's a tree or there's a wall. And what, ha what that means is people don't want to have their backs exposed, right? Because it makes them feel vulnerable. If they want to be able to be in a position, a perching position to actually stare and watch and sort of watch other humans. So this idea of like, what do people anticipate? Where does anxiety, you know, come from? Um, all those things, we've been able to translate those ideas into marketing and being more effective. So like when we create a, a marketing ad and we throw it out in the wild, when someone clicks on that ad and it comes to a landing page, you want to make sure you have the same messaging, the same imagery, you know, all the same stuff. If all of a sudden they land on your home page, for instance, which was what was done 10 years ago, there's this disjointed trust. There's a break in trust. And, and ultimately from a psychological standpoint, they don't feel comfortable any longer. They're, they're disjointed. They have to reacclimate themselves to like the landing page. And is this the right company? Did I come there? They look for things like the logo to help bind that trust signal together. And so, so yeah, to your point about psychology, it's so important that, you know, we really weave it into every single, you know, kind of interaction and touch point and, and, and that's, you know, us working behind the scenes. And that's what a lot of marketers do is they work behind the scenes to influence behavior, to drive people to their wants, needs, experiences, services, dreams, you know, you name it. Do you ever use psychology to influence your clients to accept that what you want to present to them is, is what they need? It, interestingly, we like to use data. And, but at the end of the day, it is a hundred percent a psychological move because what happens is, especially in brand, right? A lot of times brand is, is sold through emotion and what's your first expression and what's your first you know what is this what is this invoking is it causing you to leave or want to do this so we love to use data so we'll run focus groups we run user studies well we have we have partnerships with research firms where we do quali qualitative quantitative research all of those pieces 
allow us to approach our clients with a, like that sort of data, you know, data wins, if you will. But, um, but yeah, there's a lot of psychology in that because sometimes you get to a point where like, nope, the client wants this. They don't, they, they realize it's an emotional ask and we're like, that's not a good use of budget or, you know what, we just need to educate your board because your board's asking for these things because there's an emotional reason for it. And, and we love to break that down. But most of the time you're dealing with, with different psychology, um, you know, different outcomes, different, um, agendas. And, and what's nice is data really binds that together, uh, and allows us to tell, you know, a story that's objective as opposed to staying in that subjective space. Are there any tools that you use in the business that are lifesavers for you? There's quite a few, uh, because of the performance marketing side of things, we'll use, um, one, like one of them, for instance, is called bright edge. Uh, they're a enterprise level SEO company. So it allows us to get an idea of what organic terms people are using to find things. Well, organic happens to be one of the highest performing channels. So we want to make sure we're aligning ourselves with a premier, you know, uh, SaaS company that we can borrow off of, which again, right now in the movement of AI, they're able to predict what's happening or they're able to, you know, put new signals out there for how the search engine results page are showing up with conversational results. So that's one as an example. Then we have another one that's like what's called resonate. And that's what allows us to understand audience behavior and motivation. And so now we can target down from 34 to 37 year old females that live in this particular geography and these are their habits and their spending behavior. And so that gives us like an understanding of who they are that we could then target, you know, and not to say we're going to target them specifically, but from, from an aggregated data standpoint, we can target, you know, people that, that fit that persona. So that's another one. And then of course, Google analytics, which really shows us all the different, you know, behaviors on the website and, and what, you know, how, how traffic and people are moving through and, you know, what are their points of interest and are they converting based on the metrics and KPIs we've set? So yeah, there's probably, I would say a, a set of about 20 different pieces of software that and tools that we use that allow allows us to inform our skill set and ultimately change um, our mindset. Since you love data, have you figured out how much these software pieces cost altogether and how many humans you would have hired if you didn't use them <laughs> and, and what the difference in cost is? For <laughs> well, so we actually have quite a complex uh, uh, spreadsheet that we've put together that shows every single piece of software, what are our terms, you know, how much we spend per month based on traffic load. Sometimes they go up or they fluctuate. Um, and, and then which clients we actually are using them on. And then we actually uh, build that into our SOWs and it's a, and we call it a technology fee. And we expose that hard cost to our clients and saying, look, in order for us to, to produce the best work we, we have, we can, we have these tools that are very specific to the work that we're going to do for you. Couldn't do this work without them. Therefore they're part of our cost of goods. And then we pass those those costs on to the client. And we're, we, we're very radically transparent about them. Sometimes clients will say, hey, we want to carry paper with those softwares on our own because we have a big internal team and they, we want to use them on other projects. And so we'll then say, great, just grant us access to those softwares and we'll you know turn you over to our reps and they can get you signed up. And then, of course, we build affiliate uh, programs with all the reps like HubSpot and stuff. So when we yep, set those up. So, yeah, no, it's a whole ecosystem uh, that we built around our technology and, and how we use it how we communicate it, how we pass those costs onto our clients and, and how we build partnerships around it. I love affiliate marketing. I've, I've been trying to figure out how to maybe automate. It's not the right word, but how to scale it. Yeah. Um, because my specialty is human relationships. So I can yep. go to the people that own that brand and then I can go and I'll find people. But if I had a way to run paid ads, in a way that I could get, you know, a hundred leads or 200 leads or 300 leads and it would just work. Then I, yeah. I would love to do that. I just haven't figured it out because I'm not great no, at that. That's a whole, that to your point, the affiliate marketing and actually like um, getting it to not only cover your costs and then actually, you know, grow a business off of that is just so difficult because you have so many other costs that you have to build that following, right? I'm, I'm a photographer uh, in my personal time and I go and I read, you know, FS stoppers and, you know, all these other different, you know, websites. And then of course, naturally there, there's affiliate links in there for the products they talked about, but there's so much built up sort of embedded energy and momentum and effort to get me to be at that blog and to have to click on that link to get over there and then pay for that thing. And they get a little shimmy of it. So for us, we don't think of it so much as we just think more of it as, can we get our costs covered? Because otherwise it's a sunk cost and that then eats into our margins. And then we have to ultimately charge more on the service side in terms of hours or whatnot. Uh, which sometimes you can't do, right? Sometimes you're hitting that ceiling of what the market will will bear in terms of price. 
And so the best thing you, I, for us, at least in our business model is to get our, our, some of those, those cogs covered. So I had heard that if you try to put your price down low, people will not trust you because oh, why is your price so low? Do you not have confidence in yourself? So the higher your price goes, at some point, people will start to go, oh, your price is too high. And if you understand what the value is that you bring and you switch your pricing over to a value-based model, you can go, hey, look, I'm going to build you something. I'm going to charge you 100000 And I know everyone else is charging you ten, but... What I'm doing is I'm enabling you to build a $100 million business. So what's 1% or what's 0.1% right. based on value? Or I can charge you you know, 5000 now, but then I want 20% of the revenue I bring in over the next two years as a result of the value I'm bringing. Right? So some companies will be happy to go, I'll yeah. pay you value-based. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll give you revenue share, no problem. And then you could potentially make $5 million over the next two years off a $10,000 website. Or you know, they could pay you the 100000 and... So, so yeah, there, what I had learned really early on was, you know, if I start and I say $100 for this thing to you and you say yes, well, the next person I'm going to say 200 You say yes, all right. The next person I'm going to say 400 You say yes, fine. The next person I'll say 800 You say yes, next time I'll say 816 So you basically do price discovery and you figure out what the market will tolerate. And then you figure out how to scale that through value-based instead of hourly or project-based or whatever. And, and uh, yeah, we, yeah. So we, so it's interesting. In, early, in my early years, uh, I had an advisor who once said, you need to um, basically be be losing seventy five percent of your deals uh, based on pricing, and what that meant was a, a good measurement to show that you're hitting the threshold, right? But if you're to your point, if you put something in front of someone and they sign right away, or there's no price negotiation, uh, you're not there yet, right? You haven't hit the top the top yet. You haven't gotten to the, your point of value based pricing. Uh, what I find when we do price really high in terms of above the average and norm, we have to bring something very unique to the table, right? We can't, we have to, what they call disrupt the pitch, right? You can't just, otherwise they're going to compare apples to apples and they're just going to see that you're the most expensive one. But when they're comparing apples to oranges, it's going to turn their head. They're going to say, you know what? This one is telling me something I've never heard of before. They're looking at it in a new way. Um, They've got past success because of the awards they won or the client testimonials or the client's referrals and the ones that I spoke to. And so I think you can't really charge really, really, really beyond what the market will bear unless you're providing something very unique and different than anyone else. And so there's this great, there's this great um, consultant uh, author and, and even friend of mine, his name's Blair Enns, and he writes a, a book that's called um, When Without Pitching was his first sort of success. But then he wrote this book called Pricing Creativity, and it talks just exactly about this. And one of the things that's, that he talks a lot about is what they call anchor pricing. And so, you know, if you think of, I'm going to use, I love using like uh, restaurants and art and stuff as an example, or, or museums or whatnot. But think of, let's think of an art gallery for a second. You walk into an art gallery, you look on the wall, and you see this, you know, five foot tall by eight foot wide, massive picture, and it just draws you in. You're like, that is one of the most beautiful pictures ever. And then you look and you're like, whoa that price tag is 5,000. You know, you're like, wow. Then you turn around, you swivel to your left and there's a smaller one. There's a two foot tall by three foot. And that one's only priced at 7.95. And you're like, wow, that one's even, that one I, I might be able to afford. And I might be able to find somewhere in my house that I can put that one. And then there's a little tiny one that's like one foot tall by two foot wide. And it's only 200 bucks. And you're like, yeah, that's just too small. And it's not too, I don't know if I'm going to like it. Da, da, da. So what naturally happens is that people pick the middle one. And so the anchor one sets the price really high and it allows you to say, I'm not interested in, in paying that much. And I don't want the lowest one because most people will have the lowest one and I don't want to be in that sort of commodity space. Instead, I'm going to choose the middle one. And so whenever we do pricing, we do anchor pricing. We always throw up like, look, we could do everything out of the, 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 you know, out of the sky you know, or we could do the very bare minimum. And oftentimes the client wants the middle choice, not because we fooled them or anything, but it's usually the one that they need the most and they don't want, they want to test you out. They want to try out your services and naturally we'll move them into that upper category over time. So to your point, we're going to get them in in the middle and then we'll grow them to the top end after you've built trust, after they see their ROI from the effort that they put together, that $100,000 website. Maybe you got them instead of 100,000, you did 75,000. Maybe instead of 100 million in sales, they made 50 million in sales. But either way, you've proven the model that success can happen. And then you start driving, driving up the value chain. I've always liked, this is the price. There's no other opportunity. You like it, fine. You don't like it. 
no problem. I, I just had someone come to me. I have a very standard, uh, I have an affiliate offer right now. Well, not right now. It's something that I, I want to work on long term. Uh, but it's not my service. It's my partner's service. And I'm just bringing clients to him and he gives me 50% of the revenue. And so it's a, a monthly subscription and a percentage of your ad spend as well. But then there's another one where you can just buy accounts from us and, and that's it. It's a one-off. If the account dies, it's not our problem. So we tell people, you know, th this is the price, $250 for this account. And two of the people that came to us in the last day were like, oh, can I do it for like 200 And I was like, no, the price is 250 You don't want it too bad. I don't care. I don't need your business. Yeah, there's definitely an element of like exclusivity that you can assign to, to exactly what you're saying, where you're like, no, I'm sorry, this is our minimums. And I do believe that minimums are important to uphold and maintain because as soon as you start dropping below those minimums, what ends up happening is you'll naturally um, provide less service for them. With, when, and that'll then all of a sudden tarnish your brand. It'll tarnish your reputation. And, you know, and then ultimately, like we, they always say, like, you know, you have a bad experience. You're going to tell 12 people. You have a good experience. You're going to tell two people. And so the reality is you got to be careful not to accept below your minimums uh, in those moments to hold your ground. You know, but I also think you need to have you've got to have the proven model, right? You can't just come out and be confident or cocky with it. You've got to say, no, th these are our minimums. And this is why. We've got 20 years of experience. You know, we've got, you know, we're an award winning agency. We've got da, 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 and you name it. Um, you've got to be able to have the backing to to have the confidence in that and to, and to hold firm with your pricing, I, I think. Otherwise, in those early days, I hate to say it, but you do say yes to them and you don't have minimums. And that allows you to like test everything out, learn what you're good at, learn how to actually price things. Um, those are those early days where you, where you get punched on the chin a lot, you know? I, I don't like those days. The, the, <laughs> no, I'm glad I don't have those anymore. Now, now, now they're just, yeah, it's not no more punching, you know, if anything, but I will say the team below does, right. They take those because they're at the front end of the company, right. They're the ones producing the services. So they're getting hit with algorithmic changes with Google, or they're getting hit with an unperforming campaign because, you know, we mistargeted an ad or, or whatnot. And, and it doesn't happen often, but they definitely get the punches on the chin a little bit more. But again, that goes back to like, if there's pain, it means you're growing, right? So after all this time, how have you changed yourself in order to stay relevant within the company? Well, I would say most entrepreneurs, they start out with a trade, they're a tradesperson. Right, you're a tradesperson. You do. You have this skill set. You're really good at it, and you sell it, and you fill in that demand. Um, I think I've survived because I've let go of that skill set and I've adopted new skill sets. And so I always think about like these walls that you break through, and sometimes you call them chapters in your company. I would say we're on our third chapter right now, and that the first chapter was really establishing ourselves, being that good tradesperson, right, selling all my own personal services and. And, and fulfilling, you know, on the duty or the task or the promise myself with a small team, then I elevated out of being a tradesperson into a business person, right? Then it's all about like learning how to run a business and what are the mechanics and what makes a healthy business and how do we go for sales, things like that. Now we've emerged out of the pandemic. We, we're in chapter three. Now it's about sort of, if you will, world expansion. I'm moving into different markets with our business. We've created carbon copies. We have a Vegas office. We have a UK office. Um, I'm interested in, you know, doing another office, maybe somewhere in Singapore or in New Zealand, so we could ultimately become a 24 hour service agency. So we're bringing our brand, we're bringing our services, we're employing people, um, you know, we're building partnerships all around the world. Uh, and, and, and I, so that's really the next, the next stage is like, but I think if you continue to do the same thing over and over again for 20 years, yeah, you're probably gonna get burnt out, probably not gonna love it any longer. Um, but I could, yeah, I can honestly, honestly say I, I love my job. I love the role that I'm currently in right now. So what's the most important thing you've learned in, in this entire journey beyond what can, ha what you needed to do to change yourself? I, I think it comes down to building meaningful connections with other people. Um, at the end of the day, people are the variable, right? You can have the best product. You can have the best pizza restaurant. You can have the best agency. You can work for the best fortune 500 company. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about the people, people are, you know, you're inspired by people, you build relationships with people, um, you follow people, right? I, I always like refer back to Martin Luther King. He didn't, you know, he didn't say I have a plan. He said, I have a dream. And that really rallied people to get, to get them together. So for me, I think over the years, it's, it's been the most important lesson slash, you know, takeaway is that I've built 
some of the most meaningful connection, connections uh, in my life and I love them. And, and that's going to be the hardest part as we all get towards the end of our lives is knowing how many people we've affected and how many relationships we've built and that we have to let all those go, you know? And, um, and so that to me is the yeah most important lesson. I would recommend that to anyone listening that's in a business, starting a business or deep into their business is lean into the people. That's where the magic happens. That's where the joy exists. That's where, you know, you know, the, the love is built. And, um, and that's that at the end of the day, if your business is, isn't successful, you still have those connections. You still have those memories. You still have that love, that, that bond that's been, that's been built. So yeah, meaningful connections.